Okay, we'll go ahead and start. So hello everyone and welcome to the 2021 Fall Anthropology Colloquia Speaker Series. Our speaker today is Dr. Matthew Schmader, uh, but before I introduce him, please allow me to deliver one brief message beforehand. The Association of Indigenous Anthropologists has requested that the American Anthropological Association officially pause land acknowledgements, which usually goes into space, um, and that's in order that a task force that they have established can conduct um, further research and develop a set of recommendations to improve the practice. So in solidarity with this request and with the responses and opinions of indigenous people that it aims to address, I will not read UNM's statement of land acknowledgement today. I'm providing instead in the chat a link to an article explaining this requested hiatus, as well as links to the websites of some local activist organizations here in New Mexico, such as the Red Nation and Pueblo Action Alliance, where you can learn more about ongoing efforts to repatriate land and resources. So I'll put those into the chat now. So we also want to thank the Alfonso Ortiz Center for Intercultural Studies and the Latin American and Iberian Institute for their support of this speaker series. And so now Dr. Matt Schmader has been conducting research on the archeology span of central New Mexico for 42 years, studying sites of every major cultural time period from Paleo-Indian Ar and Archaic to the early ancestral Pueblo later ancestral Rio Grande Pueblos and petroglyphs and historic Albuquerque. He is the retired superintendent of the city's open space division and former Albuquerque city archeologist. He's a UNM anthropology alum um, and is presently adjunct associate professor of archeology span at the department of anthropology. His current research is on the contact period, focusing on the first tumultuous encounters between local Pueblo people and the huge Vasquez de Coronado expedition of 1540 to 1542. And his talk today will include results from recently completed work under a grant from the American Battlefield Protection Program. But before I turn over to our speaker, let me make a few procedural reminders. First, please mute your video and audio during the talk in order to preserve bandwidth. And second, feel free to type any questions you have during the talk into the chat, um, which is a button down at the bottom of the screen. And we'll address these questions during the question and answer session after the talk, um, during which time you may unmute your video and audio and ask your question directly to the speaker. And you're also welcome to, to just do that without typing your chat, your question into the chat. And finally, today's talk is being recorded and will be posted on the Anthropology Department's YouTube page. And so now without further ado, I give the floor to Dr. Schmader. And thank you very much for sharing your work with us today. Thank you very much. And um, I wanna thank the uh, Department of Anthropology at the University of New Mexico for their support through the years and, and in doing this research um, and uh, in particular to uh, Joshua Shapiro for uh, inviting me to give this talk. And as he mentioned, some of the research that I'm going to be presenting today was funded in part by the American Battlefield Protection Program of the National Park Service. So the title of my talk today is Worlds Forever Changed. And I hope that I um, am able to get to the point where I'm describing the worlds that were here and the kind of uh, collision contact between various worlds that did result in uh, the changed uh, forever state of the, all of the people involved in this huge um, expedition led by uh, Francisco Vasquez de Coronado in 1540. So that's over 480 years ago, uh, just to wrap our brains around it. Some of the um, earliest contact between outside people and indigenous peoples of the American Southwest uh, in the history of uh, this, this country. Let's see here. Okay. <clears throat> the uh, European age of discovery 
really got into high gear during the 1400s, uh, especially with Portugal beginning to sail around Africa and um, the race between Portugal, Spain, and the Netherlands uh, to try and find the Spice Islands because at that time, spice was probably the most valuable uh, commodity on the planet. Um, but the knowledge of world geography uh, at the time in the 1400s was still very limited. And from a Euro, a European uh, point of view, the three main continents were Africa, Asia, and Europe arranged in a sort of a T configuration. And there was a knowledge that if you sailed west from Europe, uh, you would in fact encounter some islands that were on the way to the, uh, the other side of the world, which was Asia. So um, when the exploration that was, uh, or expedition that was led by Cristobal Colon, who we uh, now anglicize his name as Christopher Columbus, uh, set off in 1492, they sailed to the west and they did in fact find islands, uh, which turned out to be in the Caribbean basin. But the reality of finding islands by sailing to the west was really brought home um, and was accurate. There were islands if you sailed to the west, but the islands happened to be the size of the North American and South American continents. So the knowledge of the uh, world being round and how to get to Asia was there by sailing west. The problem was they never anticipated there would be these huge continents in the way. Um, and you can see that this uh, map is by Sebastian Munster, uh, dated 1552, so it's 60 years after uh, Cristobal Colon. And you can see uh, how much lag time there is in the collection of geography. You can kind of make out North America and South America and the notation Novus Orbis, meaning the new world. So even back then, there was this um, description of these big islands being the new world. Not long thereafter, less than a quarter century, um, Hernan Cortez led his uh, sort of rogue um, expedition into the center of what is now Mexico, finds the Aztec Empire, and ends up uh, vanquishing the Aztec Empire with very few Spanish soldiers and the aid of tens of thousands of um, indigenous um, Indian allies that he had mustered enemies of the Aztecs. So even uh, by 1521, Spain had made great inroads into the uh, into what would then become uh, known as as New Spain. Now this is a map uh, just 20 years after the Ortelius map. And you can see that the geographic information is beginning to be um, quite a bit more clear. Uh, Cortez had, had wound up in the middle of Hispania Nova or New Spain, which uh, ultimately uh, we know now today as Mexico, in the Valley of Mexico, and had uh, overcome the Aztec Empire. Um, one thing I should point out is, is that uh, in, in the Middle 1490s, 1496, Alexander VI, the Pope, had uh, decreed that everything to the uh, east of a certain line uh, that ran up and down this way, everything to the east would be decreed and given to Portugal. That's why the Portuguese ended up with a part of Brazil and all of um, the rights to uh, colonize and, and um, uh, invade parts of Africa, but everything to the West was decreed to be um, the rightful and legal um, ownership of the Spanish crown. So this set up uh, this division of how, how the world was going to end up being divided according to the, uh, the Pope at the time. One of the things about this geography is there's a lot of information about place names here. But if you look off to the north and northwest, it is a big blank map. And the, the, the emerging um, ideology of the uh, geography of the time was if you went north and northwest, this would be the route 
to find other great civilizations. Of course, Cortez had already found the Aztecs in the Valley of Mexico in the 1520s. The uh, Pizarro brothers had gone down to Peru and vanquished the Incas in the 1530s. I say vanquished. Um, they did enough damage to be able to claim the land in the name of uh, the king. But the next civilization uh, following all of those events was supposed to be to the north and northwest. And the thinking really was that by going overland, uh, this would be the shortcut, the overland route to Asia. And so the impetus to explore beyond this, the center of New Spain um, and to go up into this area that we now know as the American Southwest was to find the doorstep to Asia because Asia held the key to all of the riches that Spain and Portugal were in a race to try to find. So the thinking was really to march um, a, a few months in this direction and you would end up at the doorstep of um, China or India or maybe Japan China most likely was, was the, uh, the target. And so this area up in here was the, the thought of location of some Asian great civilizations. Now, following Cortez, uh, Cortez had started ranging all across New Spain and Mexico and, and was looking for his own uh, route to find Asia. And um, he needed to be uh, brought under control, as did uh, some other people like the infamous slave raider Nuno Beltran de Guzman, who'd been up and down the west coast of what is now Mexico, uh, capturing um, the indigenous peoples and enslaving them. And so the, the king of Spain appointed Antonio de Mendoza to be the first viceroy of New Spain in 1535. So this is less than 15 years after Cortez had um, already vanquished uh, the Aztec Empire. And if you look at this word viceroy, it means under king. So everything that Mendoza did was for and under the direction of his boss, the king. And his boss, the king, happened to be King Carlos I, the first king of a unified Spain of the early 1500s. He was um, just 19 years old when he became the king of Spain in 1519. But more significantly, King Carlos I ends up becoming the Holy Roman Emperor. And uh, as the Holy Roman Emperor, King Carlos I was arguably one of the most powerful people in the world, certainly the most powerful person in Europe. So the events that I talk about today are only just a couple of degrees removed from King Carlos I down to Antonio de Mendoza and a couple more degrees of separation between that and the events that I'm going to describe that took place just here outside of Albuquerque. Well, there were rumors of settled lands to the north and northwest, as I said, and this was supposed to be the doorstep to Asia. So Mendoza orders uh, a friar, Franciscan friar, Fray Marcos Denis in 1539, this is 18 years after Cortez, uh, to find out uh, what was going on. And, and Denisa goes straight from the uh, town of Culiacan, San Miguel de Culiacan, north to a land that we now know as Cibola. There's a county in New Mexico that is called Cibola. Um, Cortez had a, uh, a scout uh, from Morocco. He was either Moorish or, or of African descent. And his scout Esteban was ahead of him and made it all the way to Cibola, which is now the location of today's Zuni Pueblo. But Esteban got himself into some uh, trouble by doing some things that were uh, very unacceptable. We don't know exactly what, and he ended up being killed. And when Denisa finds out that Esteban, his chief uh, guide, had been killed, uh, Denisa gets close, but apparently never gets to Cibola itself. He just sees it from a distance and sees that there are settlements and comes back and tells Antonio de Mendoza, the viceroy in Mexico City, 
yes, there are settled lands. And yes, this is the uh, place that you need to go and, and send uh, an exploratory party to set up diplomatic and economic relations um, with this uh, other civilization so that Spain would then have the, uh, the, the advance, the jump to begin to trade uh, directly with, with Asian um, polities at the time. So Mendoza is convinced and he ends up choosing as the leader of his expedition, Francisco Vasquez de Coronado y Luján, who at the time was about 28 or 29 years old. Um, Coronado was the governor of a province in New Spain called Nueva Galicia. Uh, he was an administrator, a well-connected uh, person in terms of um, knowing Mendoza very well and, and uh, married into a family of wealth, but uh, he was not a, uh, a military man. He had very little military experience. <clears throat> this is another photo <laughs> snapshot of Francisco Vasquez de Coronado. And you can see that uh, actually we do not know what Coronado looked like. The other portraits of Cortez and Mendoza and uh, Carlos I are real paintings, real portraits, but nobody ever uh, painted a portrait of Coronado. The reason I show this is because part of what we need to keep in mind in discussing all of these events is that there's a certain mythology um, cachet that we have developed ourselves um, in more recent times that, that uh, misinterprets information and to a certain degree uh, glorifies um, the events that I'm going to talk about. So of course, at that time, every um, Spanish commander of an expedition wore suits of armor, had a steel helmet, um, and things like that. And, and, and it turns out that this is basically not true. Mendoza wanted to lead this expedition actually himself, but he was already um, uh, in his 40s, which at the time is, you know, pretty old, right? Um, and so he decides, uh, because there are uprisings that are welling up in New Spain, that um, he will not lead the expedition. And he chooses the most trusted person he can find, who is Vasquez de Coronado. Now, this is a text heavy graphic, but it's got a lot of important information. They assemble the pieces of all of this expedition in Compostela, de, uh, which is a, a, the, the provincial capital of Nueva Galicia. Uh, today, it's uh, known as the city of Tepic, which is um, not far from um, Puerto Vallarta in the state of Nayarit. They, they muster before uh, Mendoza and Corn Vasquez de Coronado, that is all the people going on the expedition who are Europeans mustered to declare what they're bringing so that they could establish their um, proportion, their percentage of any of the riches that they were about to find. That occurred on February the 23rd, 1540. And this whole expedition ended up uh, lasting two and one third years, 845 days. They cover about 4,600 miles, 7,700 kilometers in a round trip. There were 350 uh, European men who enlisted uh, to go on this uh, exploration, plus 20 clerics, so about 370 Europeans. And one of the other um, sort of misconceptions is how well uh, uh, outfitted and armed the expedition was because for those 370 men, there were only 29 crossbows and 35 arquebuses, which is the first primitive form of a musket and uh, an estimated 83 swords. So most of the European men did not have anything even approaching the uh, military, European military technology of the day. 90% of them had what were called armas de la tierra, um, arms of the country. And these were native weapons that were gathered up in the vicinity to try to uh, outfit the men who were going along. But remember too, this was not a military expedition. This was an economic and diplomatic um, expedition 
to go and establish diplomatic relations with an Asian um, civilization and set up trade. So it's not surprising that they weren't heavily armed. One of the most important things uh, to keep in mind in all of this is that there were at least 1,300, maybe as many as 2,000, could even be more of um, people who were called Indios Amigos or Aliados, Indios Aliados. And the Indios Amigos were essentially um, Mexican indigenous soldiers who enlisted or um, otherwise were coerced to go along on this expedition to, and they were really the ones who provided the, uh, the military uh, expertise and, and manpower behind um, everything that was, was being arranged. So three fourths of the people who went uh, ended up being not Europeans, but Mexican indigenous soldiers. <clears throat> and there were likely an equal number of other people uh, who were never even discussed, never even talked about. And these are the people who really made the whole expedition go. And I, I want to be sure to um, emphasize the role of the women, the tortilleras, who were on this expedition, because without the women to make the tortillas that the uh, people had to eat every day, thousands of tortillas every day, this expedition never would have succeeded. So the whole enterprise was predicated on the, um, on really the, the labor on the backs of the women tortilleras who made all the daily food. But there were also people who carried loads, porters, uh, load bearers, and um, people who tended animals. And chief among the animals, um, and th th these are exact counts here, there were 558 saddle horses and at least 600 other pack horses and mules. So over 1,100 horses and mules came up on this, uh, this long line going north uh, out of Mexico and into the American Southwest. The first time that horses had come back up into the American Southwest since uh, they had gone extinct 10,000 years earlier. It's not exactly known how many head of livestock, but there are estimates at various times between 5,000 and 10,000 head of livestock. So they were literally driving along the food that they were going to eat on the hoof um, and leapfrogging and, and setting out supply lines and provisions as they went. Um, but the, the uh, counts and estimates of, of this are not accurate um, all the time. The main thing, though, is that uh, although King Carlos sanctioned and authorized this expedition, it was to be funded privately. So all of the people who participated put in their own um, supplies, their own goods, their own wares and everything like that. The total estimated value was about 600,000 silver pesos, which is about the equivalent of 19 tons of silver uh, about 20 or 25 um, million dollars just in the uh, value of silver, not adjusted for inflation. So altogether, this was the largest land-based expedition ever put together under the auspices and the sanction of the Spanish crown in its colonial administration of the Western Hemisphere. It was a very big deal. I want to also make sure that I emphasize the uh, cultural diversity of this um, whole expedition. There were Europeans from uh, 10 or 11 different countries and polities. Most of them were Spanish, but they were from other countries in Europe. There were North Africans, Moors and Sub-Saharan uh, Africans, some of the first Africans to ever come into uh, onto soil that is now the United States. And the Mexican indigenous uh, soldiers, the Indios Amigos, Indios Aliados, came from as many as 15 or 20 either cultural groups or um, geographic areas in uh, present day Mexico, Mexicas, Tarascans, Tlaxcalans, Tlaltecans, and on and on, either from the Valley of Mexico, Central Mexico, or from the West Coast of Mexico. And this is not what the expedition ended up looking like. This is uh, some of the um, glorification that has happened over the years. This is a painting by Frederick Remington in the 1890s or so. Coronado sets out to the north, and this is a well-organized 
um, defile of uh, foot soldiers and, and mounted soldiers. They're all dressed in, um, in their armor. But actually what turns out is uh, this is not the case because that wasn't the way that they're equipped. But the other part about it is this expedition was plagued by very bad timing. They leave from Compostela, which is uh, again near Puerto Vallarta on February, uh, late February of 1540. And they follow the, the coast past Culiacan and then they strike out to the north to uh, head towards Cibola, which was where Denise said they should go. There was also thought that the West Coast, or what is now known as the um, Gulf of Cortez or the Gulf of uh, California, swung around in this direction. And there were supply ships that went up along the coast that ended up uh, losing track of the expedition. And they, they went up the um, mouth of the Colorado River as far as Yuma, Arizona before figuring out that, uh, that this coast did not make it over towards the direction of Cibola. By the time the expedition gets to where uh, the modern day border wall is on the um, border of Arizona and, and uh, Mexico, it is June and they're crossing the desert. So it's extremely hot and uh, People are tired, hungry, and, and pretty anxious about the outcome of, um, and, and, and to reach where they're supposed to get to. They make it to Cibola, which is the location of today's Zuni Pueblo in early July. The Zunis think that, that uh, Coronado is coming to avenge the death of Esteban. Coronado thinks he's about to find a great Asian civilization. And uh, neither side, being correct and, and both sides at odds with, with each other, the inevitable happens and there was a battle fought. The first battle between outside people and um, the Pueblo people of the American Southwest occurred on July the 7th, 1540. Uh, the Zunis end up being overwhelmed um, after a very uh, brief and hard uh, battle and end up uh, withdrawing to one of their defensive locations and surrendering their Pueblo to Coronado. Coronado for his part did not find Asia and uh, is faced with this decision about whether or not to continue on or turn back. Asia is supposed to be over here um, and he sends a couple of scouting parties who end up reaching the um, Grand Canyon and, and finding the uh, Hopi villages um, but reports come in that there are settled lands to the east. And so Coronado sends his captain of the artillery, um, Hernando de Alvarado, out to the east. Um, and when Alvarado goes far enough to the east, he arrives at the Rio Grande uh, Valley in central Mexico in the fall of 1541. Alvarado says this Rio de Nuestra Senora flows through a very wide level and fertile land planted with cornfields. There are some groves of cottonwoods and there are 12 towns. And those of us who live in the Albuquerque area recognize this description and recognize this scene. These are the Sandia Mountains, the cottonwood um, canopy forest along the Rio Grande, the Rio Grande flowing through uh, the heart of uh, New Mexico. So it's September 1540, Alvarado urges the relocation of the entire expedition to the Rio Grande Valley. So they arrive at the Rio Grande Valley um, and they end up uh, in an, a, a place that they call the Tiwish province. That's how this is pronounced, Tiwish. And the Tiwish province, for those of you who aren't from uh, New Mexico basically runs from Albuquerque, uh, the city of Albuquerque, north about 15 or 20 miles to the town of Bernalillo. And these are 11 of the 12 uh, towns that uh, Alvarado ends up reporting. Um, this northern one here, Kawawa, I'm going to talk about uh, in a little bit. And the research that I present today takes place at this um, uh, Southern Tiwa ancestral village of Piedras Marcadas, 
which is about 11 or 12 miles away from Kuawa. The, the 12th town is most likely today's um, Pueblo of Isleta. So this Tiwish province is the ancestral homeland of the Southern Tiwa people, uh, the descended um, communities who today live in Sandia Pueblo and Isleta Pueblo. Now, another text heavy slide, but don't get uh, turned off by it too much. By the time the whole expedition gets to the Tiwish uh, province, to the north end probably of, of uh, this Tiwish province, they were very ill prepared for cold. And it was about to be one of the coldest winters on record um, in the winter of 1540 to 1541. They were running out of food, they were very cold. They ended up taking over one of the biggest villages in the Tiwish province and appropriated both clothing and food. They uh, have a discussion with the, the only elder Pueblo who is named in all of this, uh, um, an elder named Shawian. And Shawian says, if you want other uh, food and clothing, you have to go to each of the villages and requisition uh, that yourself. I don't control uh, the leadership of the other villages. It's the same way with uh, today's uh, modern Pueblos, they're autonomous. Well, what happens is um, the, the uh, captains begin going up and down the Rio Grande Valley and appropriating whatever food and clothing that they wanted to. Um, then there's a, a rape or an attempted rape of one of the, um, the Pueblo women when her husband tries to get uh, justice. Um, he's rebuffed. Uh, the, the Pueblo people then retaliate by, uh, by killing a few of the Indios Amigos guards and stealing horses. The Spanish retaliate by attacking one of the nearby villages and setting it on fire. Uh, the the uh, Pueblo um, warriors who were fighting uh, at, with them at that time thought they were surrendering peaceably, but then they apparently end up uh, um, being taken and, and uh, there was an attempt to burn them at the stake and there was another uh, battle. And by this time, Shawian and the uh, surviving remainder of the Tiwa people had seen enough and they, they went to uh, one of their other villages, one of the strongest of their villages, barricaded themselves in, fortified themselves. And um, when this is discovered, then an ensuing uh, another round of uh, fights, battles, skirmishes, and, um, and, and basically atrocities occur. By the time it's all over, there are uh, something like uh, 300 to 500 uh, Tiwa people had lost their lives. So all of this put together is known as the Tiwish War, which is the earliest named sustained war by historians in the history of the United States. And it happened here uh, right outside of Albuquerque. When the city of Albuquerque acquired the land rights to the village that I call Piedras Marcadas, we began to um, discuss how to best uh, manage the site by having uh, tribal consultations, meeting with um, elders of the descendant communities. And one of the things that the elders and descendant communities um, advised us was that we archeologists had basically back and clean, dug up all of their ancestral villages and this site being the last one that was uh, basically intact, that they pleaded, we not engage in these broad scale excavations and instead try and do research that was as non-invasive uh, as we possibly could. So having taken that into consideration uh, in about 2005, the city of Albuquerque National Park Service embarked on some um, geophysics studies using remote sensing instruments. And the most effective of the remote sensing instruments that we had found uh, was called electrical resistivity, uh, which shoots a, uh, a current between two probes into the ground, measures the speed and strength of the currents. And then by analyzing those data over um, uh, these transects, then uh, you, can, you can try and see what may be below the ground. This is Christine Markson, who did all of the electrical resistivity work 
in 2005-2006. When the resistivity results came back, uh, it was really quite remarkable. This, this part of the slide here on the left is the village of Kuawa that I mentioned earlier. This is one of the villages that the uh, descent communities had said, you've excavated everything that we had in the village. This was excavated in the 1930s by under the directorship of Edgar Lee Hewitt, who was trying to find sites that related to the Coronado expedition. So hundreds of rooms were excavated in a period of just a couple of field schools uh, during the summers in, in the late 1930s. On the right is the electrical resistivity image that we obtained at Piedras Marcadas. And if you look closely, you can see the outlines of the adobe walls. I call it adobe, it's, it's their mud wall construction um, with, with stone footings. But the similarity is Basically, it's identical. Well, the sites were occupied at exactly the same time in the late 15, in the late 1500s. The Tiwish province had been heavily um, uh, settled starting in about 1300 uh, AD with a number of uh, smaller villages that later then consolidated in, into bigger villages in the 1400s and early 1500s. So these are, are um, quite uh, similar uh, and, and, and identical in time and, and architectural configuration for that matter. Uh, and this is Vinny Pueblo at about the turn of the last century. We think that the, this is pretty much what these adobe mud wall uh, villages may have looked like, uh, mostly one story, but two and three stories high, uh, broad expanses of, of walls. Uh, you had to access rooftops by way of ladders um, and um, without having excavated anything. This is a, a good prototype for what we believe the architecture ended up looking like. I did some uh, uh, drawings here by looking at the electrical resistivity uh, results over here on the left. Again, you can see all the adobe walls um, and the areas that are darker here, murky, are probably areas of two-story and three-story adobe construction, which when the walls uh, collapsed in, they pancaked in and, and made these thicker areas. So this is areas of two-story and three-story rooms. I just did a cartoon uh, outlining a number of the um, visible adobe wall fragments segments um, and some of the key features. There are a couple of kivas. This kiva here that you can see is three fourths of it is intact. This subterranean that is underground. This is an above ground kiva that was made basically by virtue of building rooms around it. And the big villages that were reconstructed um, in the late 1400s and early 1500s ended up having long expanses of uh, wall exposure on the exterior and very few narrow passageways going in and out from the outside to the central part, the interior public space that, that is um, open and was available to all of the uh, inhabitants of the Pueblo called a plaza. So there's at least, you can see this passageway right here and another passageway right here. And I label them um, on the on the cartoon drawing on the right hand side. This is the architectural framework within which all of the events I'm going to end up describing took place. When we cleared the shrubbery and vegetation from the surface of Piedras Marcas Pueblo to facilitate the uh, electrical resistivity, since you can't do it um, going through the uh, salt bushes here, bits of metal became um, evident, we started to find um, some metal fragments and it took them for identification and immediately um, the word came back, well, these are consistent with metal from the 16th century. So it may very well be that you have a site that is related to the Coronado expedition. So at the suggestion of Charlie Hecker, who's retired from the National Park Service and others, we started doing systematic metal detection surveys. It's basically another remote sensing instrument, right? Um, and when we did that, we ended up, these are all the fine spots here. You can see the stakes with the yellow tags 
of 16th century pieces of, of metal. These uh, artifacts are not very deeply buried. They, they are between most of them, 80% of them are between three centimeters and eight centimeters in depth. So that's all the soil accumulation that has happened at this site uh, in 480 years. When we mapped out and collected all of the 16th century metal that we could detect, we ended up with over 1,600 pieces of 16th century um, uh, metal. And all of this is in an area that is 2.3 acres in size, just to give you an idea. And since it's football season, just to give you a little bit better idea, this yellow rectangle is the size of a football field, about 60 meters wide and 120 meters long. So everything that I'm talking about, you need to remember, basically is uh, jam-packed into this 2.3 acre area, not much bigger than the size of a football field. What are some of these things? A lot of them um, are not anything you would necessarily uh, write a whole dissertation on. Uh, metal fragments, broken pieces of wire, broken pieces of nails. Um, but this is uh, something that is not uncommon um, in terms of finding about 20% uh, or so of the metal artifacts are uh, just big fragments or, or little fragments of um, corroded and rusted iron. This is the kind of artifact that we start finding from the electrical resistivity clearing. This is a wrought iron nail, handmade wrought iron forged nail with a, a beveled uh, head, facet headed nail. And in fact, this one even has some wear in the middle of it from uh, where it must have been nailed into some piece of wood and caused this kind of uh, um, uh, friction and, and wear on the wrought iron nail. We found, I think, 125 um, wrought iron nails, facet headed nails that are 50% or, or greater um, in intactness. At the muster roll at uh, Compostela, some of the men who came along declared that they were bringing sleeves or gauntlets of chain mail. And indeed we have found um, whole links and broken links of chain mail that um, match up exactly with the descriptions from the, uh, the muster roll. But there are a lot of other uh, very interesting personal items that have been found in this metal detection, clothing lace tags, clothing fasteners, needles, a big copper awl, buckles, strap ends, uh, medallions, and this is the uh, a bridle cinch for a horse, the snap tip of a dagger. Um, there's a good uh, 250 personal items of this nature that would have been uh, possessions of people would have been uh, actually on them. Now, remember I talked about the crossbows and, and uh, arquebuses. The crossbows were shooting um, copper, uh, solid copper tips uh, the arrows are called bolts, and so the, the, the tip of a crossbow bolt is called a bolt head. And uh, we have found now um, over 33 copper crossbow bolt heads and another 14 fragments. You can see that a number of them are intact. But you can also see how many of them have um, damage from impact. Uh, they're bent, the ends are splayed out, um, and these are, these are broken off of the wooden uh, shafts, bolts, uh, by virtue of having impacted something. The muskets were shooting lead balls, and the lead ball calibers range in size from 25 up to 55 uh, in caliber. Caliber is uh, um, degrees of an inch, so 55 is 55 hundredths of an inch. Um, many of them are in the uh, 40s caliber. You can see the mold marks from casting on some of these. Um, and you can see the impact that happens when the lead ball struck against a wall or some other kind of hard object. We did some <coughs> uh, lead isotope analysis on the copper and the, and, uh, the lead. And uh, all of the indications point back to these 
artifacts having been made and sourced back to uh, some of the copper mines that are in uh, present day central Mexico in the state of Michoacan. So this fits in perfectly with the uh, provisioning of the expedition before it had left. Now the Indios Amigos uh, most certainly didn't have access to the European weapons. Even the Europeans didn't have much access to the European weapons, uh, but uh, they were feared um, fighters. The history of um, and native um, soldiers in, in Mexico was centuries long before uh, the Spanish ever arrived. Uh, one of the most ferocious of the native weapons was a wooden war club with grooves in it that was outfitted with obsidian blades. And we have no, uh, they call ma uh, Makana, uh, Makawi. Uh, we have no direct evidence of, of these, but one thing for certain on the surface of Piedras Makalas, there's a lot of broken obsidian. And we've been trying to analyze this obsidian to see if it, uh, what sort of breakage patterns that they may have that could um, fit. It's a, it's a difficult proposition because, of course, the Pueblo people living at Piedras Mercadas were also making their own tools and had generated other obsidian debris. So it's not very easy um, uh, to figure out yet, but we're still working on that. One thing, though, and that is for certain, there's not a lot of um, arrow points, stone uh, projectiles, but um, the, the few that we have found um, are consistent, some of these, the top row here, are consistent with Pueblo style of projectile points that were in use um, before European contact and at the time of European contact. And some of these um, stone projectile points are consistent with styles that are found in Mexico. The basely notched and the side notches that are quite high up on the body of the uh, projectile is consistent with Mexican style um, projectile points. The problem is there are also projectile points from the Great Plains, for example, that have a similarity. And so you cannot uh, entirely base, rule in or rule out um, the existence of these as, as being uh, definitive, but they're suggestive of the Indios Amigos, certainly this spear point here, I've never seen anything like it uh, at any site anywhere in the Rio Grande Valley. And I'm pretty convinced that this and some of these are uh, referable to the Indios Amigos. But if you need something that's really sort of um, kind of a smoking gun in all of this, um, Dr. Steve Shackley, who is a, a adjunct at the, Anthropology Department at the University of New Mexico has recently done uh, x-ray fluorescence and has uh, identified now three pieces of obsidian from a uh, obsidian source in northern Michoacan, not far really from the uh, copper mines and, and uh, lead sources that I described earlier, uh, called Zina Pequero. And these um, are, are uh, definitively traced back to the uh, volcanic and obsidian flows of Zinapecuaro. The three pieces that we have now are the only three known in the entire um, uh, lower 48 states of the, of the United States. There's one piece from San Antonio um, that the provenience isn't very well known. So this is a direct link between the physical culture of the Indios Amigos and what has been found on the site uh, surface of Piedras Mercadas, the distance uh, down to that obsidian source is 1,700 miles away from Albuquerque. Well, probably the most well-known uh, longest used offensive weapon um, in the history of mankind is called a sling. And, and, uh, and slings are used to throw sling stones. They've been used all over the world. Um, this is a drawing from what is called the Codex um, de, uh, the, the Lienzo de Tlaxcala Codex, and it shows a mounted Spanish soldier with a spear and a shield, and his Indios Amigos, the Indios Amigos who were there to fight alongside the Spanish with their war clubs, shooting crossbow <laughs> um, arrows, by the way, and 
here are their opponents who are trying to uh, fight them off probably up on a, on a uh, hillside or cliff top. And what is between the Spanish and the Indios and Migos and, and uh, the defenders of this hilltop? These are stones. And I would argue that these are sling stones that were captured by this um, rendering of this battle uh, in the Lienzo de Tlaxcala. Now on the surface of the site of Piedras Marcatus, we have now begun to identify the presence of sling stones. So you have primitive European warfare technology in the form of crossbows and, and muskets. Now you have added into that the um, weaponry of the Indios Amigos, possibly their stone projectiles, but most certainly their stone sling stones. Not all of them look like this, but if you notice the grinding that has occurred on the, on the midline of the sling stone, and we have found now 79 uh, sling stones lying on the surface of the site at Piedras Mercadas. What were the Pueblo people doing in defense of this apparent attack? This was a battle. And what was their defense? The description in the documents say that they would let loose a shower of arrows. And the other thing that they did, uh, Pedro de Castaneda de Najara, who was the uh, principal chronicler of the uh, Coronado expedition, said the enemy. And that means the Pueblo people. The enemy had been getting ready for many days and had so many stones to hurl that they laid many of our men out on the ground and a number of them had died. Well, working out on the site and having all of this area cleared, I recently looked around and I realized all of the rock that I was seeing lying on the surface of the site were these throwing stones. Um, and I, I embarked on a, a project here and mapped, this is a one acre area 60 meters by 60 meters. And within that one uh, acre area, I mapped nearly 1,800 stones lying on the surface of the site. Uh, I, I superimposed those locations on top of the adobe walls. And uh, there's quite a strong pattern that has emerged. Uh, and I'll show you a little bit more about this. The, I wanna just point out that the, the Spanish, uh, viewed uh, an architectural construction like a Pueblo, the same way they, they looked at castles when they were fighting um, some of the battles in, uh, in Spain during the Iberian conquest. Um, so they would try to get inside by assaulting the walls, climbing ladders. Uh, they would try to get control over passageways. And once they had gotten inside of sites, they would try to force opponents into uh, corners or enclosed spaces. If none of that, that worked, then they would just um, lay siege to the site and uh, camp outside, and make sure that water and food could not get in. Um, and, and eventually the uh, people who were trapped inside would have to give up. And of course they had the shock and awe um, firing off these uh, muskets and um, horses uh, uh, running around and stuff like that. Uh, so they had a number of different ways to try to overcome uh, the Pueblo defenders of, of Piedras Marcadas. I just wanna look really quickly at the way this uh, played out. You remember the distribution map that I showed you, all of the green dots are non-iron, they're lead um, and copper alloy, and the red dots are iron artifacts. Um, and there's certainly a concentration at the Southeast corner of the site on, along the outside wall and another one a little bit further away uh, up in the northwest um, part of the site near that passageway identified. There's a huge cluster of uh, broken wire and, and nails um, over the top of the above ground kiva. And finally, I think that once um, they had gotten inside of the uh, plaza, there was uh, some conflict, hand-to-hand -hand combat, basically, that went diagonally from northwest to southeast, crowding people into the southeast corner of the site. Now, I know we've got some battlefield people here. I'm, I'm running up against an hour, but I'm just going to show a couple of quick maps. Um, battlefield people, this, 
This graphic is just 60 meters wide by 30 meters um, deep. So it's about 100 feet by 200 feet. And even within that small area, there's uh, 15 cop uh, copper crossbow point head, uh, bolt heads, which are indicated in red. Uh, the blue indicates lead musket balls. The green indicates personal items like uh, clothing, lace tags, buckles, things like that, that were actually physically on the bodies of uh, some of the Europeans as they tried to approach and, and get into the, the site by scaling the walls. And the black dots are the locations of the sling stones. I think the sling stones are being thrown from a distance by the Indios onto the rooftops to try to keep the Pueblo defenders at bay. Uh, this is just a detail of the sling stones here. The uh, red dots are the smaller sling stones and the, uh, the um, red squares are the larger ones. I call them sling bombs. They, they weigh uh, between a pound and up to almost uh, two pounds in weight. But these are being thrown from the outside up on top of um, the, the roofs uh, to try to keep the, the Pueblo defenders down. You can do a lot of different things with maps. I superimposed the locations of all of the throwing stones, um, uh, the architecture and the personal items, the, the ammunition in the form of the bolt heads and the lead balls and the sling stones. And you can see that this area, the Southern part of the site was really the focus of very intensive uh, fighting, basically hand-to-hand -hand fighting. Um, and it's in an area that, that basically is uh, half of those site investigation area, less than, less than an acre, has all of this material jam-packed into it. This is just another graphic that uh, emphasizes the density. This is like a heat map. And you can see that the density of the throwing stones is outside of and along the walls, but not on top of it. Uh, in particular, the, the very high density of throwing stones that was right outside of this passageway. The passageway was barricaded off, and so somebody must have been trying to get in and break into the passageway, and that was met by the resistance of the Pueblo people throwing these rocks. And I have to make sure that I mention that when I say the Pueblo people, the records indicate that at some point in time, there was a conference that was held, and what they say is, the Spanish wanted to know if the Pueblos, uh, well, the, the, the Pueblos had asked whether or not the Spanish would treat the women and children who wished to surrender um, uh, with dignity and, and, and uh, not harm them. So it's very clear from the records that the resistance that was put on by, by the Pueblo people, the Southern Tiwas in this case, was a resistance that was carried out by women, children, and men. Every single person who lived in that village who was barricaded in had collected up all of those rocks. And when the time came, they had uh, the rocks at the ready, prepared in piles on tops of the roofs and let them go. This was um, a brilliant strategy and it did work. Uh, the thing that didn't work in the end was um, the lack of, uh, of water and, and the Pueblo people had to try to make a break for it, which did not end up working. Um, I'm going to try to go through this very quickly. I appreciate people hanging in. I guess my introduction is too long. But um, so what was, uh, what was wrecked and what was salvaged as a result of this uh, huge expedition that came into the American Southwest? Well, <clears throat> for one thing, there was a huge amount of um, exposure to the geography of the American Southwest. Remember, I said they found the mouth of the Colorado River. They, they had uh, been the first uh, uh, non-native people to see the Grand Canyon, to, uh, to make contact with the Hopi, the Zuni, the Acoma uh, Western Pueblos, to have arrived at the Rio Grande Valley and to have made contact with Rio Grande Pueblos. Um, the expeditionaries went as far north as Taos. They went out to uh, Pecos uh, Pueblo, which is here, Sicuye, and all the way on to the uh, Great Plains who were the first people to describe Buffalo. But they never did find any route to Asia. So Coronado wasn't paid and none of the uh, people uh, invested. Uh, 
to get geographic information. So it ended up being a great failure when you come down to that aspect of it. Um, now, what did happen is Coronado was um, brought up on charges of cruelty to the um, to the Pueblo people, and his captain uh, Lopez de Cardenas was also um, brought up on charges. Uh, one of the things they were accused of was um, letting loose war dogs, um, and they they held a trial a few years after Coronado was acquitted, and Cardenas ended up uh, uh, spending a few years in minimum security uh, prison. And that was about the extent of any punishment that happened. But you have to step back and look at, at this because this was basically um, a clash between the world's greatest empire at the time and the Pueblo people who had uh, the uh, greatest concentration of population probably anywhere in the, in the American Southwest. Um, a clash between the largest expedition ever organized by the uh, Spanish crown um, and it occurs here at the largest of the uh, Rio Grande uh, Tiwish or Tiwa um, Pueblos, the most intact one and, and the most intact of the um, battlefields that we have for this entire um, time in history. The Coronado Expedition is glorified uh, to a, a great degree, as I had indicated before. Um, there's a sort of a triumphalism that uh, that is um, surrounds it in terms of, of what had happened. And certainly for the Corto Centenario, the 400th anniversary of the uh, observation of the um, expedition in 1940, there were reenactments that happened even at the University of New Mexico and other places. There were commemorative brochures and stamps and all that sort of thing. But I think we have a different, uh, bit of a different viewpoint of it today. One of the things in particular, when you're talking about the Southern Tiwa was, there are 12 towns at 1540 located on both sides of the Rio Grande outside of Albuquerque. The estimate of population was something between 10,000 and 20,000 people in this 15 mile stretch of the river. Within a space of 80 years, by 1620, there were only three of the uh, ancestral villages still left and the population was about 800. So 90% of the Tiwa uh, population had, had been moved out, um, uh, relocated, uh, or, or had um, died off uh, as a result of this first contact between the outside world and, and the Tiwa world um, that was um, in existence in the 1540s. So when you go out on these sites today, you talk to the Pueblo elders. Um, they're very moved by being able to be out there on that location and they know that they're basically standing on the spot where their world was forever changed. Uh, the world of the, the Tiwas and the rest of the Pueblo people in the American Southwest was one way in 1538 and it was another way by 1542. Um, and the, the effects were uh, long lasting. But I have to say that this is not the story of a battle and it's not the story of the things that, um, as bad as they were, all the things that went wrong, because in my mind, this is a story of survival. It's a story of resiliency. It's a story of the strength and courage of the Pueblo people, that they were able to be exposed to not only this, but all of the things that happened in the 1600s. Um, and to have their descendant communities be alive and thriving today is a testament to that, that strength and that ability. Um, and we can't overlook the fact that somehow emerging out of all of this first contact between the outside world and the Pueblo world is the beginning of the mixing of the bloods, mestizaje, the, the emergence of the mestizos and the mixed bloods that especially in New Mexico end up making our uh, culture as unique as it is. So for better or for worse, the world's forever changed included eventually the intermixing of these cultures to create some of what is unique about um, the world of New Mexico as we now know it. Uh, there's a couple of good 
references that you may want to avail yourselves uh, of. The historians Richard Flint and Shirley Flint have, have worked on um, the, translating uh, documents of his uh, Coronado expedition for over 30 years. Here's a couple of uh, their, their um, books that you may want to look at. And here is my email address in case people want to try to contact me or find out more because there's a lot more information than what I was able to even over running uh, by 10 minutes here uh, present. And I know that Joshua said that the uh, land acknowledgement is uh, being held in abeyance, but I want to recognize that all of the research that I've been able to privilege to conduct over all this time uh, took place on land and sites that are ancestral to the Pueblo people and especially to the Southern Pueblo, uh, Southern Tiwa uh, people who descendant communities are still in the Albuquerque uh, area. Uh, the research was um, funded in part by the National Park Service American Battlefield Protection Program, uh, Open Space Division, the Open Space Alliance. And uh, I wanna be sure that these are my own personal views and not the views of any of the agencies that I've, um, I've mentioned. And with that, I think I have uh, reached the end and would be willing to uh, entertain any questions and throw it back to, uh, to Joshua. Hi, thank you so much for a fascinating uh, presentation today. Um, I um, open up the floor now to um, anyone who has a question, feel free to just um, turn on your camera and microphone and, uh, and ask away. Where is the, is P-U-A-R-A-Y located? I don't know how to pronounce that. I live in the North Valley. Uh -huh. And I'm familiar with Alameda and San Diego Pueblo. I worked for the San Diego Pueblo Education oh. Department. But where where is this other? How do you say that? And where is it located? Uh, the the village is called Puarai, and it's a very important um, site because the the next expeditions that came. Uh, I was 40 years before the Spanish came up again, but in 1580. Um, there were a couple of priests who ended up being martyred at that site. And then uh, in retaliation, Puari, like um, many of the other villages was burned down. But Puari is in a subdivision that is just south of the Sandia uh, Pueblo boundary. Um, I'm trying to think of the name of the road. It's Pony Road or something. I've been in touch with uh, John Romero who is the uh, uh, lands um, uh, lands administrator? I think it's at Sandia. I don't know if he's still there. Is he? I don't know. It's been a while since I worked for them. Okay. Oh, okay. It's it's basically it's about a half a mile south of the uh, uh, south boundary of San Sandia Pueblo Reservation on uh, on Edith Boulevard. Um, in that uh, little private subdivision that's uh, just there by the boundary. Can you kind of picture where that is? Yeah, I can, I can. And it's been built over. There, there, uh, there are houses. It's underneath several houses along a little irrigation ditch there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, um, thank you, Matt. It's uh, Tim Garcia here. Uh, oh, yeah. I'm interested. Um, thank you for your talk. I really appreciate it. I'm interested um, in uh, um, the Hemis area and the Coronado Expedition, the Hemis Springs area, specifically um, um, where, where, where the giant stepped on top of the mesa. Um, are you familiar with that archaeological site? Yes, I am. And, and um, Can you talk a little bit great. about that site? Um, I, can you talk a little bit about that? I, I've been to the top of that place a few times. Um, I can tell my father was born and raised on the Guadalupe River right, right there. And I spent a lot of time up there on that mess as a child and took my kids up there for several hikes. And um, uh, I was always curious about that site. And this is the main, one of the main reasons why I wanted to, to listen to your presentation, sir. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, uh, Tim, first of all, thanks, and it's great to hear from you, as always. Um, the, the documents say that uh, uh, a scouting party from the Coronado Expedition went as far as Hemis, 
Um, but I, I think that they ended up basically gathering up some material like local obsidian to use and, and uh, trying to make contact with the Zia Pueblo to try and get food and, and clothing, uh, some other shelter, but they didn't really have that uh, strong an impact on Hemis Pueblo. Um, I think that the site plays a much, much bigger role uh, later on in the um, Pueblo Revolt. Okay. And uh, there's, there's a strong record of um, conflict that happened during the Pueblo Revolt and, and the Hamas actually came very close uh, to getting back and, and, um, and, and winning that battle. But ultimately, the, uh, uh, the, the the Spanish were able to um, overtake them. Um, but this is this is a, a more of a revolt period site, if if I'm not mistaken. There's there's great information written on this by Matt Liebman. Say again, Matt. Matt say again. Liebman. Yeah, Matthew Liebman, L I E B M A N N. And Matt Liebman has written about um, the archaeology of the Pueblo Revolt. Um, uh, so he he's got great information on that. There's there's a book about the Pueblo Revolt by um, Bob Prusel, P R E U C E L. Bob Prusel, the archaeologies of the Pueblo Revolt, and they talk about uh, that area up there as well. Okay, let me ask you one other question: How extensive? Is that site up there on that mesa? Because from what I it was quite large back when it was at its peak. I'm not, you know, I walked around it a few times and yeah, I mean, it's extensive, but how, how, very large one? Oh, it's enormous. I think that, I think that they uh, think it's about 2,000, over 2,000 rooms. Um, so, okay, it, yeah. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Cool, thank you. Well, I have a question for you, actually. Um, I'm not sure how much you, you've worked directly with the, um, the historical textual documents, um, but I'm you know, intrigued by the sort of social and, and linguistic um, situation that, that, that characterized the, the expedition and the encounters here as well. Um, and, and I was wondering um, if there is anything that indicates, um, you know, what attempt at, at communication was being made, were the, the Spanish relying on the, um, the people they brought along with them from Mexico to, as translators in some sort, I know in, in Peru that, that happened where, um, I think some Carib people actually were, were used to be translators with, um, with Inca who were speaking Quechua. So, you know, it, did, it wasn't very successful translation strategy, but I'm just curious, if, you know, if what kind of communication was going on and how that might've played a role in, in how the conflict unfolded. Yeah, uh, actually that's, that's a really great question. Um, one of the things about it is that because the Indios Amigos themselves derived from uh, a number of different cultures. They had a, a lingua franca, um, a, a commonly known language, which was Nahuatl. So among themselves, they probably all uh, ended up speaking Nahuatl. And the Europeans probably all spoke among themselves, probably spoke Spanish. Now, they had, um, they had some translators who were able to kind of work between Nahuatl and, and some of the uh, um, languages of the Western Pueblos. But what happened fairly early on was that um, Coronado uh, ended up taking a couple of, they started out as guides, but he ended up uh, basically keeping them as translators and captives. Um, one of them was known as Igotes, who was from the um, uh, Pecos Pueblo, uh, another one, uh, Isapuete, but he, he uh, basically knew that he had to have that communication link. And so he did that by, by getting a guide and then basically making that guide a prisoner. The other thing, when you read the uh, um, documents, they'll say things like, they indicated to us by signs <laughs> that where we wanted to go was this far away or they indicated to us by signs 
that um, they would not give us what we wanted. So uh, just even trying to uh, do sign language, I think was was used. And I didn't uh, get to say this, but there, there's a reading of a uh, formal text that the Spanish used to do called the Recarmiento. And you'd come up to a, a, a village of people, read the Recarmiento, and the Recarmiento would say, we're here on behalf of the King of Spain and, and the, his Holy Father, the Pope. Um, and we mean you no harm, but we wish for you to submit and become vassals uh, of the church. Um, and if you so do, then we, we uh, commend you for it. But if you don't, we will uh, make war on you. And if we have to make war on you, that is something you brought on yourselves. So they would read this in this 15th, 16th century Spanish to you know, Pueblo people who couldn't understand uh, any, uh, a word of it. And so when the recommendation was over, then they'd say, well, do you submit? And then the answer was that there would be hails of arrows and stones in, in response. So this language thing is, is um, actually a, a very big deal. Thank you so much. Hopefully that answered that. <laughs> Do we have any more questions? Yeah, hello. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, yeah, hi, Matt. This is Robert Delarusso. How are you doing? Hey, Robert. How are you? Doing very well. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in. You bet. That was a really nice presentation. Thank you. I had one quick question about all those obsidian blades that you found that were supposedly lining the edges of those war clubs. Mm -hmm. uh, were you able to source any of those? Great question. And the answer is yes. Um, the sourcing on 98% of the obsidian uh, comes back as local. It's either from uh, the Hamas or from Mount Taylor. Mount Taylor is maybe about 20% of it, and, and the Hamas is about 80% of it. And so, um, and people used to say to me, well, the only way you're going to be able to sh uh, show that those are uh, used by the Indios is to find Mexican obsidian. Well, my, my thinking was that the expedition had never provisioned itself with the thought of, of um, being somewhere, you know, that far away, that long into it. And they, they probably used up any Mexican obsidian that they might have had with them. In fact, I think that a lot of the Mexican obsidian might have been used up even on the way on the route to Cibola because there are other skirmishes that they fought. And there could be Mexican obsidian at the uh, battle site of Hawiku in Zuni. Um, but the sourcing at Piedras Marcatas comes back very heavily uh, from the Hamas. So we've tried to look more at the uh, morphology, you know, and, and frankly, we were probably um, misleading ourselves to only look at obsidian because I think at some point in time, if you've got a wooden war club and have to use something, you're using anything you can. So it could be chalcedony, it could be chert, it could be fossilized wood. Uh, and things like that. So breakage patterns um, will tell a, a tale. There are uh, people who are doing experimental archaeology by recreating these and then looking. You, what you get is you get a, a you get either a, a snapped off corner or a, a, a midline fracture, a medial fracture, because half of it is in the groove and half of it's sticking out. So if it hits something, it snaps down the middle of it. Right. Interesting. But I need a. Uh, I need a brilliant uh, graduate student who wants to really look at the obsidian um, uh, morphology <laughs> to, to tease it out more. Yeah, well, that's really I'm not smart enough. I had one other question real quick. Uh, those those um, copper crossbow bolt heads that you found, mm -hmm. I was looking at the photographs that you provided and a couple of them look like the copper artifacts that, um, Alex Carota found down in the Tularosa Basin at some of the Pueblo sites down there. He hmm. was, they were uh, jokingly referring to them as copper burritos just because they were folded over. But is it possible that somebody with a crossbow was down in the Tularosa Basin at any time? It's possible that, um... 
metal was really fascinating to to people down there and and i and they were doing all sorts of stuff uh trading metal around and and it's quite possible that um copper crossbow bolt heads could have been recovered from a number of different uh Coronado contexts and traded around as uh, sort of a luxury, uh, a luxury good. Mm -hmm. um, I'll have to look at those and see. You know what's really weird is that uh, the local archaeologists who were looking for Coronado here, they found a couple of cro copper crossbow bolt heads, and they thought they were pen nibs. <laughs> they they didn't even, they, they were looking for a Coronado and, and thought that they were finding you know they weren't even finding the ammunition. But I'll have to get with Alex on those. I know that there are also, I didn't even get to mention, there's so much stuff I didn't mention, but there are probably 150 pieces of um, sheet copper scrap that I've recovered. Uh, so they were, they were clearly carrying copper around. And in fact, one, uh, one co uh, crossbow bolt head was expediently made, it was a cone. And we found the, the expedient cone and we found that this scrap of sheet that was left over from um, and they were they had identical isotope uh, signatures so copper was being carried around the iron was being carried around in fact the the nails were probably even used as a form of trade good and currency among the members of the expedition so uh, there's a whole lot of um a whole lot of research that needs to be done uh, further research on uh, just the use of the materials i think some of the sheet uh, Copper, in fact, may have been sewn into uh, quilted vests um, as a form of uh, body armor. Oh, yeah. Well, I've surmised that in some cases. Very cool. Well, thank you very much. Thank it's you. great to see you, Robert. Hope you're doing yeah, well. Yeah, me too, Matt. Yeah, I am. You too. Take care. Have a good Thanksgiving. You too. Do we have one last question? All right, well, thank you so much for sharing your research with us. This was really fascinating. Um, and um, please tune in to the, the next uh, colloquium talk, which is um, not next Friday because of the break, obviously. Um, but the following Friday on December 3rd. Um, and thank you all and have a nice weekend. Thank you, everybody.